Back around World War I, families played this game with pencils and a pad of paper. Various companies published this game in the 1930s. Then, Milton Bradley released a plastic version of this game in 1967. It is a guessing game between two players, and the purpose of the game is to destroy the opposing player's battleships. Thus, we have the game called Battleship. And my five-year-old son and I have enjoyed playing the game Battleship many times. And I recently came across the electronic version and brought it home knowing my son enjoys playing the game. And we sat in our basement trying to figure out how to set up this electronic version so we could play. But it's more of a complicated process to set up because you have to electronically register where all of your ships are placed. And I had my youngest son try to eat the small red and white pieces and my middle son pressing buttons at random while my oldest was sitting there waiting to play. The whole time, I'm trying to figure this game out, reading the instructions, screwing up the instructions, trying the instructions again, rereading the instructions. And this was a reminder to me as a parent that I need to be more on top of my game to be an active learner in the digital age in order to continue to connect with my kids. And so today we are wrapping up the social media series and Battleship will guide us throughout our entire episode as we talk about what to do as parents and youth workers with students when it comes to social media. I'm Jeff Eckert. And I'm Jason Brewer. And this is The Thought Factory. We want to thank you for listening in to our podcast. We are, I don't know, a few episodes in. We're now over 3,000 listeners on The Thought Factory podcast. Many parents, many youth workers are listening, and many of you are letting us know. So we want to say thank you. And we're grateful for your time that you give us to hear what we have to say. And if you want to know more about Jason, myself, our organization, check us out at neverthesame.org or on our Facebook page where we post these episodes and dialogue about uh, some of the things we're talking about. Yeah, we're continuing our series on social media, and this is the fourth episode in that series. And so if you haven't listened to our previous three episodes on this topic, we really encourage you to do so. You can pause this episode and go back, or you can finish this episode and then still go back. It's really the freedom of, on their part. Wow, they can kind of do whatever they, they want there. They can do whatever they want. We're going to let you. Thank you. Now, we're diverting from our typical approach in this episode. And if you've listened to any of our past episodes, you would know that we normally don't want to tell you you know, our ideas, maybe, or what to do. Our approach really is to get you to start thinking and talking about the topics that we're presenting. But today we want to go in a little bit of a different route. We want to actually offer you some advice about your students and social media. And we realize we do that very lightly because we're not the end-all experts on everything. We do have a lot of experience. We're both parents. I am a parent of two teenage students as well. But we we want to do this today because we've as we've gotten into this idea of social media, we feel like there's so much to say, and we've become pretty passionate about it, and we want to give you some thoughts that we have. So we're going to start with you that are parents in this episode, talk to you a little bit, and then in our next segment, talk to you who are youth workers. We know that social media is not going away. It's not a trend that is just a quick fad, but how we approach Social media is important, how to be intentional with it, with our students, our our kids, and how you approach it is a lot like the game of Battleship. You can be their enemy on opposing sides and, and feel like you're firing missiles at each other and you're at war with each other, or you can be alongside them. You can play this game together and feel like you're on the same side, but really it is a guessing game. It is something that we don't have it all figured out. Every new platform of social media comes out and we don't really know what it's about. It's a guessing game, whether it's appropriate, whether we want to introduce it to our our own lives, our kids' lives, our students' lives. And yet we should be willing to come on the same side as our, our kids, our students, and figure this game out together. But before we get into the guidelines, we as parents and youth workers need to ask ourselves, do these guidelines apply to me too? And we may need to look at ourselves first and think about these guidelines before we begin to apply them to our students and kids. So parents, let's talk as parents on on what we can do here with students and social media. The one thing I want to say at the outset here, we're going to offer three ideas, suggestions, but, but before we get into that, let me just say this. You need to start where you are. Now, Jason and I are in different stages of life. My students are older And I've got one student in college and then one in high school and one in middle school. And so for me, with 
older students, it's a little bit overwhelming because I came into this with my students, with my kids as a parent at the beginning of this shift to social media and and smartphone technology and all that and how it's slowly but very um, steadily encroached upon our family and, and how we're trying to raise our kids. And Jason has got younger kids, and I was just telling him the other day that I'm a little bit envious of his situation and position as a parent because he can start very fresh with his with his younger kids in because they're not engaged in social media yet. And for me, sometimes it's easy to think of like, well, it's too late. I, I miss some things. I'm going to share some of my own personal mistakes. So, so with that in mind, whether your students are older like me and you you already have teenagers or if they're younger and if you're listening to this, just start where you are. Don't, don't say, Oh, I missed it. Or, you know, that ship has sailed. It's okay. So let's just start with that particular idea there. So we're going to share with you, Three ideas for things that we would suggest for you as parents to do with your students in social media. Yeah, that first idea that we want to start with is have a conversation with your student about social media. And that may seem very obvious or simple, but by having that conversation, you're opening up the door to knowing where they're at, their interests, and saying, I'm wanting to enter into your world. I want to know more about this. I want to be engaged and explain to them that you're doing this for their protection. I mean, as an adult, we know that the world is not a safe place. We know what is out there in the dark shadows. And sometimes students, kids can be naive. And I even think of my young kids and I go, man, I want to keep them innocent, but I know I brought them into this world and this world is not a safe place. And so I have to help them navigate through the hard times, the dark times and and so explain to them that you're doing this because you want to protect them, not to, to keep them away from the darkness or keep them away from uh, any harm, but more going, there is harm and you'll probably experience it, but how do you navigate through it um, and, and be well on the other end of it? And the other part of that conversation that allows you to do is, is be a, a proactive parent and not a passive parent. Um, we have no time to be passive on this topic. I, when Jeff, you mentioned about being envious of my position of, of three young kids who have not been introduced to social media, I, that conversation comes from how we are trying to be intentional and trying to be very proactive and not just sit back and go, well, they're eventually going to uh, engage in this stuff. And I don't really need to know about it because that's just their world. But to go, how do I protect them? How do I be very proactive in learning about social media and, and technology and smartphones? And, and what's the next thing that's going to try to rip my, my kid away from the good in life? Yeah. So number two, remind them of your authority as a parent. You have the right to look at their phone. 24-7, you have the right to take away their phone. You should have all the passwords for everything on their phone. You should regularly look at their phone. I think, I, and I feel this way as a parent, sometimes we, we feel like our authority has been taken away because our kids have so much direct access to so many things. There used to be that gauntlet that you'd have to go through to get to your students. If you were a youth worker, for example, and you wanted to connect with students, you had to call home. And um, if you were wanting to date, you know, and I wanted to date girls a lot of times, there was no other option but to call their home. And, and so some of that's been taken away. And so as a parent, we feel like we're playing defense all the time. But we think it's very important that you remind them, and only you know how to do this with your kids in the appropriate way, but to remind them of your authority as a parent, that you are the authority figure and that you have the right to look at whatever they want. And when they get this technology, they all of a sudden feel like it's their right. And I think we have to remind them, no, this isn't just a right. This is a privilege that you have. So reminding them their authority is, is very, very important. I think we can look at this number of things of, of looking at their phone, knowing their passwords, and kind of as a hovering parent type of mentality where that you are not releasing any control. Or maybe you think, well, I want my kid to know that I trust them. So why would I always look at their phone or, well, 
you can trust them and still say, hey, I still have the right to be a parent and to to exert my authority on this area where you just never know. And what you said is, is we have given up, um, we have given up our rights as parents because of the privilege that we're giving them to our students. You have that uh, old saying, I think, on your desk, Jason, trust but verify, right? Yes, good old Ronald Reagan. Yeah, so trust but verify, and that's important. And number three is to set boundaries. And we want to talk about a couple things here when it comes to setting boundaries. Boundaries like time and location. So, for example, I think it's important for you to sit down with your students and say, we're going to set some boundaries. It's not anything goes. We don't play that in any other part of life. And it should be the same with this technology, with social media. And I feel like asking your students for input about screen time and about use is is really smart and wise as a parent. And I think at the same time, when you're asking for input, you need to remind them, hey, I'm getting your input, but I'm going to make the final decision here. But when you ask them, that allows them to have a little bit of say and allows them to express some of their ideas. And some of them actually might be good. So you want to set rules for home and public, and you want to set rules and boundaries for their bedroom, which now by some experts is being called the tech room. It's no longer the bedroom, but the tech room. And things like bedtime. We've seen studies, we've heard stories where students are up all night texting because they've got their phone you know, right there by their bed, and so there's things like that. So setting boundaries for time and place is really important. You should get their input, and then you should let them know I'm getting your input, but I'm going to have the final say here. And give them clear boundaries about specific places in appropriate times and appropriate places and appropriate locations. I know a parent that one of the boundaries is taking his kids' phones and bringing them into his room and plugging them in. So they don't have it when they're they're in their rooms for bedtime. But he has mentioned that uh, his daughter's friends will text her during the night and and her phone is illuminated in the middle of the night. He'll wake up to a buzzing or a beep and at one, two o'clock in the morning and the ceiling's illuminated and all that stuff. And it's her friends texting in that late hour and kind of expecting a response. And he's like, man, what are, what are these kids doing up this late? And it's important to, to have those boundaries. And I even think of the, the app use. And when we, we have smartphones in the hands of students, anytime that we have an app or we have another social media platform come on the scene, what it does, is it creates this appetite that needs to be fed. If you are into Instagram, you have to feed it. You have to find things to post about. You have to take pictures and create captions. And then you are checking in on all the likes and the comments. And it creates this appetite. So you have one platform. So then you go to Twitter and then you go to Snapchat and then you're all of a sudden you're going to all these different platforms and all of these create different appetites that need to be fed. And it takes time and it takes energy and it takes us away from other things. And so when they want to download a new social media platform, we feel like it's a good idea to set a boundary that says you can't add on a social media platform unless you can give a good rationale for why you want to use that. And so rather than just saying, hey, whatever you want to do, if you want to download a new social media and they tell you about it, we think it's smart and proactive to say to your kids, these are your approved social media platforms and this is what you can use. And if you want to add another one, we need to have a conversation about why that is and give us a good rationale. Yeah, like how will they use it for the good? Like what's your purpose of having this platform? Where will they get the time that they... They need to fill this appetite in using this app or whatever. And what are they giving up by using this? You know, we, we find studies that people, students are losing sleep. They are not finishing their homework or getting really good grades when they do their homework because they, don't, they aren't focused. Uh, they may not have the ability to or the time to do a new skill or a hobby they may not go outdoors and enjoy God's creations, and their their relationships, their friendships are are not as deep because they are so consumed 
by spending time on Snapchat and, and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and so on and so forth. So when you add a social media platform, you're making a choice. Mm-hmm. And we want students to know that. We want to be teaching them that. So as parents, we feel like that's a really important thing. And I thought it would be appropriate to share with you the rules that we have in our household about phones and social media, if this is helpful at all. We have three basic rules. Number one is you have to carry conversation with an adult to have a smartphone. And when I say carry conversation, what I mean is not just have a conversation, but carry a conversation. More and more, and I've told my, I have three daughters, I've told them this, if if you can have good social skills in the 21st century, you're going to be ahead of the much of the rest of society because we're, that's a, a skill that seems to be kind of losing right now. And so we say to them, if you want to have a smartphone, you have to carry, be able to carry a conversation, not just have it, but you can go in there, you ask questions, you you talk to them, you show interest in them. So it's it's this social skill that they have to have conversations. So number one, they have to carry a conversation with an adult to have a smartphone. Number two, our rule is we control everything. We control the apps that they use. We know all their passwords. We control their phone, their use. We know where they are. All their settings on their phone, that's something that I personally go through and make sure that I know what their settings are so that they know right at the beginning of the game we're going to control everything. And our third rule is we don't allow them to say anything negative about anyone on social media. And what we found is there's so much cyberbullying happening. And and this was something that got hot a few years ago, and then it, it felt like it it went away as far as a topic, but I, I feel like it's resurfacing now a lot, maybe more and stronger than ever. But just imagine, if you will, a, a world of students and even adults, but a world where no one said anything negative about anyone's social media. We feel like that's a really good, important skill for them to learn and not to get in the habit of just flying off the handle on their social media and saying what's ever on their mind. And in, in this election cycle that we just got through, one of the things that's really dawned on me about social media is people are just saying whatever's on their heart, however they feel at the time. And that's typically, if you can imagine that in a conversation, if you're in a conversation with a person and just say whatever emotion you're feeling, that may not lead to a very great conversation. And that is the danger of social media. So we want to teach them some discipline in that area to say, you may be feeling or thinking negative about someone, but as long as we're your authority in your life and you live in our household, you're not allowed to say anything negative. So you need to be able to carry conversation with the adult. We control everything, and you can't think, say anything negative about anyone else. Do they need to be 13? That's a good question. I was telling Jason earlier. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> I was saying, I learned recently, and, and I was unaware of this as a parent, that Pretty much the standard age for all social media platforms is 13. I have uh, a daughter, my youngest daughter, is younger than that age, and she's already on one or two social media platforms. And and someone shared with me, I heard a presentation, and they said, if you allow your students to, to break the rules there, you have to basically lie to be able to use that social media platform. So I just realized as a parent, I screwed up right there from the very beginning because they entered the social media world under false pretenses. And and I feel really bad about that. And so that's a huge mistake that I've made that I would encourage you, if you have kids under 13, that's another safeguard for you to say, listen, we can't do this. You can't use this yet. You're 11, you're 12, you're 10, whatever. You're not allowed to use this social media platform. So find out, do your homework, and see if they're of age, because that's a, a huge part of it. Yeah, we hope this helps you as parents. And We hope that you continue to dialogue with us further on our Facebook page. And when we get back, we're going to talk about this idea of students and social media with youth workers and the perspective that we bring as those that work with students. Hey, I'm Justin Warrens, and I am on staff at a church in Metro Detroit. And I joined up with Never the Same Camp about five years ago when I was a youth pastor at this church. And I have loved our experience there for our students and our leaders, the partnership that we have formed, the momentum that we have gained in our ministry, uh, not just in the summer, but throughout the year has been catalytic. We love how NTS pours into our leaders and our students, and that as we join with NTS, 
podcast together, we come back uh, ignited for our school year. Even things like CYC, which is Claim Your Campus, has been an incredible way to see our student leaders grow in their faith and increase in their prayer life inside of their schools. So uh, as a church that has a movement uh, of a growing uh, connection of young uh, students on a multi-site campus, it has been a gift to us. This next segment is more geared towards youth workers. And just like the the first segment, we had three ideas that we want to share with you. And so we want to share with you three more ideas more geared towards youth workers. And the first idea is be intentional about your controlled venues. Now, one of the controlled venues that I am a part of is never the same camp as the environments, the learning environments, the rallies, the the big production areas where all the the students gather and and what you would expect in, in a large arena. And one of the things that we notice is that when students have access to phones and they are in that arena, they are more distracted, more on their phones and less engaged with what's happening on stage and in that environment, all because they have a phone in their pocket and they'd rather just search the the internet or play games. And it just takes away from those moments that we're trying to um, bring these students through. And when, when we have students that are on phones, whether they're sitting in the back or even in the front row, and you're just going, why are you not engaged? Tell them, when it is okay and when it's not okay to use your phone, um, when when it's worship time, when it's teaching time, when when it's okay when it's like during the program and you want to have everyone take pictures and upload them to Instagram or, you know, you can still use technology to engage these students, but make it clear that there is some intentional times when it's good and when it's not good and help them understand that and the importance of that. Also help them socially interact with each other. I think with our phones, we can tend to use that as a safety net, as something that is a default in our interaction with other people where we we don't know anybody. We may, us adults are, are guilty as well. We go into a, a crowd, we go into a room, we don't know anybody. And what is our, our social crutch? It would be our phones. It's like, all right, I might as well just start dinking around and can we help students engage socially with other people when they're there in those environments and in, in youth group when they're walking through the doors of the church when they come on campus for NTS camp uh, at a retreat are we willing to be that guy or girl that is a little bit tougher on them and saying let's just put the phones away and let's enforce the fact that we are asking you to keep the phones away. So when we see the phones out, we're going to either take them away or have a conversation with you or put them in a bin that everyone has to you know, participate in and whatever. But don't be afraid to be that bad guy or girl when it comes to firm boundaries. And then refer to, to your youth group rules often, not just one time at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of camp or the retreat and just say, this is the rule. Uh, and it applies the entire time, but bring it back, Re- make it a reminder, make it something that, that students know and know often. Yeah. I feel, I feel like part of that too, about being intentional, what you're talking about, Jason and helping <clears throat> students socially interact is the idea of training our adult staff to be able to have that interaction. And I think some of those key times are before and after. You know, if you have students uh, there and they're coming in early and you've got them hanging around and you've got adults there as well, that's a good time for them to spot those students maybe that seem a little bit on the fringe, not really connecting, go up, have a conversation. And so that's a a good way of doing it. The second idea that we would share with you is to be a resource to parents and your church. And what does that mean to be a resource? Well, I can tell you this, and as a parent I'm speaking as well, is that we need help as parents. So offer resources. Typically, as youth workers, it's a little bit more our world. And so, especially if you're a paid vocational uh, guy or girl, you may have a little bit of time to investigate resources, provide real-time meetings. So you might say, hey, we're going to have a meeting next month, and we're going to invite parents at some point to come in. And we're going to talk about your students' smartphones and social media. I guarantee if you throw that topic out, you're going to get them there and provide some resources. So 
provide that to parents and lead the way. I think you should be leading the way in communicating the gap between what Craig Detweiler in our previous episode talked about, the, the gap between digital natives, which are students, and digital immigrants, which are adults. You can lead the way in communicating between the gap in those two groups, between people that grew up with that and they don't know any other way, and adults who know the difference and see the changes that uh, digital media, social media has brought into our world. So lead the way in that and tell your staff, board, and church about the digital reality that you're working with students. I feel like one of the statements I've made for years is that if youth ministries aren't leading the way in the local church, there's something wrong with that youth ministry. And this is one of the ways you can do that. It's one of the ways, if you're familiar with the 360-degree model of leadership, it's one of the ways you can lead up to people that are leading you. So whether that be your boss, your supervisor, your senior pastor, your directing board, whoever that might be, this is a way where you can provide resources because what we're finding is uh, everyone is overwhelmed with this. And so any resource you're offering will be accepted. And also with that, in being a resource, it's a good reminder to support parents that might be a lot more strict in this area. Now, as youth workers, sometimes we may tend to see that as a hassle. So, for example, if we have a student in our youth group and they're over the age of 13, they're not allowed to have a Facebook account or Twitter or whatever, or they may not even have a phone yet. And that's our only or primary way of communicating with our students in our network. And it can be tough if we can communicate with every with 99% of our kids, but with one, with a handful, we may not be able to get to them that way because their parents are strict. And now we have a choice there. We can kind of make it tough on them and that family and how they operate. Or we can come alongside and find creative in other ways. So it, 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 it can be a divisive thing if we have those strict parents and we kind of see that as a hassle. But I can say as a parent, more and more, I think those restrictions are, are important because, Jason, you alluded to this earlier, it is a dangerous world. And the more we understand about this world of social media, the more we can understand that some of the forces behind it many times in many of these platforms and people using it are trying to get to our kids and not for good reasons. So those strict parents can maybe be our best allies and help us learn as well. So don't alienate them and don't make it tough on them, but rather engage them. So be a resource. The third thing we would say is to assume that students want boundaries and direction. We believe, I have a a personal belief, I've always felt this, and the more I've read and studied, I've seen this to be true, is that students do want boundaries and they do want direction, and they're looking for that. And so we can come in with that understanding and projection on them that they want that. So when it comes to assuming they want boundaries and direction, provide accountability help them. They may be looking for that. Provide a safe space for them to share. Now, we've mentioned one of our primary venues that we engage with students. Both of us are engaged in local churches, but our in, but our venue, NTS Camp, and that's really built on the backbone of small groups and adults from those churches where they attend that are there with them in that shared experience. And throughout the years, there have been so many stories of great discussions about accountability, great safe places for students to share. And one of the things that came to mind for me was the, seems like the countless stories of guys in their small group that are talking about their porn problems. And so when they're doing that, they feel like at camp they have a safe place that they can share that. And that is so key because students want a place to share Sometimes and many times, it's much easier to share in that venue than it is at home with their parents. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of there's a lot of guilt. They know they want to change if they're doing things or going places online that they know are wrong. So, assuming they want boundaries and direction, and then providing a venue and a safety and a structure where they can do that is really important. We are wrapping up our series on social media, but we will be talking about this more in the future. There is plenty to talk about, more resources to share with you guys, more experts to hear from. And we as well don't want to just be one and done on this topic, but we want to extend this conversation throughout the year. 
uh, multiple times because we know it is so important to be discussing this. And just like going back to the game of Battleship, it's important to know the guidelines. It's important to follow the rules or, or have instructions to be able to play the game uh, and enjoy the game. Because we've mentioned this in the past episodes of it's not bad. Social media is not bad in and of itself. It's an, more of an extension of who we are. But if we know how to navigate and operate in this, this realm, this environment of social media, we'll enjoy it more. The students that we are over, uh, our kids, they'll enjoy it more. Um, but it's this game that we should really be able to follow the guidelines and instructions. And going back to the game that I was playing with my son uh, and trying to figure out this electronic version of Battleship, after a while, we eventually just put it away. We just shelved it. Kind of a, all right, well, I'll come back. Dad's going to read the instructions thoroughly, figure out how to actually register all these ships so that we can enjoy this game together. But we never actually played the game together. And we spent all this time together, but we never played the game. And my son knows how to play the regular game of Battleship, but this digital version just kept us from playing together and connecting. And, and so I just am reminded of how important it is to engage in the digital world so that we can also engage with students and our kids. So as we wrap up this episode, we just want to go back and review, and I want to talk about what we mentioned to parents, three things to think about. Number one, have a conversation with your student about social media. Number two, remind them of your authority as a parent. And number three, to set boundaries in the time and the place and the social media platforms that they're using. And for youth workers, number one, be intentional about your controlled venues. And number two, be a resource to parents and your church. And number three, assume students want boundaries and direction. So we encourage you to share this. There's a lot of parents that you probably know and youth workers, and we want to continue the conversation because this is on the, on the major forefront of where we are with students in our world today in our culture. Now, speaking of culture, I cannot tell you how excited I am for our next episode because, Jason, we will be talking about one of my favorite things in the world, Star Wars. Star Wars. Yes. yes. And I believe you're going to have a really special introduction for that episode. I, yep, I'm putting it together right now. I am so excited yes. to reveal it next episode and... And then by that time, I will have done a Star Wars marathon so I can discuss it intellectually with you the entire time. So we can't wait for that. We're going to we actually talk to students about Star Wars. So we're going to get their input. You're going to hear about what students and you may be thinking, what in the world does Star Wars have to do with students? We're going to tell you we can't wait as well as I'm going to promise I'm going to share with you a few Star Wars secrets that I've learned over the years. So if you're into Star Wars, you may learn some things you didn't already know. And you'll hear me playing with a Star Wars figurine the entire time. Yes, awesome. All right. So we'll see you on our next episode.